Recently, I had a friend who was applying for a job, asked me if I would be a reference for him, and I said I'd be glad to. And uh, so he gave me a copy of his resume so that I could be familiar with his, you know, professional work experiences, things he had accomplished, just in case they, you know, asked me, you know, to talk about his work experience. And so I looked through his resume, and um, after looking through his resume for a little bit, I talked to him. I said, man, your resume is great. Honestly, I'd really like to meet this guy because he sounds honestly like a lot better than you, who you actually are, right? And, it, you know, we, we laughed. He laughed about it. He thought it was, it was funny, right? It was, it was a joke. But oftentimes on resumes, people will do things like this, right? How would you write, I changed a light bulb on your resume? I single-handedly managed the successful upgrade and deployment of new environmental illumination system with zero cost overruns and zero safety incidents. Right? Whoever wrote that response, they need to be hired. Like that's, that's a great way to phrase that, changing a light bulb. And we do that, right? In fact, and part of what my friend did in, in applying for this job is he said, you know, it's not like you can just send out a resume and fill out an application. He said, I've gone through all of my social media and looked at all of my web pages, all of the things where I am, and make sure that I'm presenting, you know, the right image to my potential employer. And <clears throat> I thought that's such a, a, a weird thing that, you know, you would have to do because my friend, he's been online since he was a teenager. And, you know, I'm like, did you delete the pictures of you with a mullet, you know, because I hope not. If you did, I've got more. I'll put them back on. Um, but he wanted to be careful of his image. And so I thought, what if, you know, what if we were, you know, looking at the uh, online presence of a Bible character? Um, and today we're going to look at a, a man named Samson. And I was wondering, well, what would it look like if we looked at Samson's online presence, as it were? Granted, Samson didn't have the internet back then. Um, but I thought, how, how close can I get? And I, so I, I googled um, Samson coloring pages, and uh, this is what I came up with. I think the first one would be this, and this would be like maybe his, his old MySpace photo, and he would title it like me and Kitty, right? Um, you know, and you know, kind of regrettable. And then this one would be like his dating profile picture, right? Because he's flexing, jawbone, Right, Delilah's this way. So that would be like his dating profile. And then there'd be this one, which would be, it'd be her Facebook update, right? It'd be like their relationship status. And she'd be like, hashtag love him, um, but hashtag not really. Um, so, you know, it, and then there would be this one, and this would be his LinkedIn profile, right? Because he'd look, you know, real bowed and crazy long hair. And look at him, how powerful he is. And then there'd be this one, right? which would be like the Twitter, I guess, of, of the social media because, you know, very few characters. But then the last one would be like from his hometown newspaper, and it's like the most realistic. Like he even, even shows where they've sewn his eyes closed, right? Kind of, and I don't know, like you won't ever find this as a child, child's coloring page here. It's a little gross. In fact, we can go ahead and get that off the screen, Laurie. It's making me a little sick. Um, <clears throat> right, but... People do this, right? You, you sort of, you cultivate, you make sure that your, your appearance, the way that you appear on, on social media or in a public eye is, <coughs> is a certain way. Um, you know, you don't, you don't put the worst parts of yourself out there. Today, I want to look at this story of Samson, and I want to look at it in terms of of what his life was like and then understanding gratitude. This, this month we've been doing the gratitude challenge and there are still bingo cards available where you can fill out, do these different sort of tasks to feel and express gratitude to people in your life. And several of the blanks on the gratitude challenge ask things like, like write about a time when something went wrong. Or a time that something went wrong and, and God showed up for you powerfully, right? And there are several of those things and, and we want to be able, I, I want us as a, as a people to be able to connect not just gratitude to God for the obviously good things in our lives, 
But at the same time, to be able to, in the midst of storms and trials and, and all of the, the dark times of life, to be able to still experience gratitude. And so today I want us to look at Samson and his life, uh, the things that happened and that he did in his life, and get a picture of what his life might have been like with if he had expressed gratitude, if he had had uh, gratitude to the Lord in, in these dark times, and also kind of get an image or a picture of what led him there. So this morning we'll be reading in, in Judges chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse 3. And, and before this, <coughs> before this, we learn a little bit about Samson and that he has fallen for a Philistine girl, which if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, the Jewish people were not supposed to associate or, or marry into Philistine families. That was, that was not allowed. But he has fallen for this Philistine girl. And this is what it says in verse, chapter 14, verse 3. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistine. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. And this is an overarching theme throughout Judges, that each person living in this time period, they did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. And part of what they're the author of Judges or the, the chronicler is doing is he's trying to help us to understand that, number one, our own sense of right and wrong isn't superior. Like it isn't, it isn't adequate because our sense of what is right and wrong is determined by what we see. And the goal of Scripture is not for us to do life based on what we see, but to do life based on what God sees. Right? Because if, if we can see what, and if we could see what God sees, then we would very easily do what he says. But we can't really see as God sees. So we have to trust him. But in Judges, everyone is doing what they see as right. For Samson, he, he saw this Philistine woman and he saw that she was right for him. And disregarded what the, what the scriptures had told him was right. Disregarded what his parents felt was right. He searched out this woman and did, he connected with her because it was right in his eyes. And then in verse 4, <clears throat> verse 4 we have this verse. That his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord. For he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. And it's this verse that is, makes this story difficult to, to really kind of wrap our minds around sometimes. Because what we're told, what we see very clearly is that Samson is doing what is wrong in God's eyes. He's doing what is right in Samson's eyes, but what is wrong in God's eyes. And yet, verse 4 tells us that God is in the midst of this plan. Right, that, that this is all going to work out according to God's plan, even though Samson is doing what the Lord told him, commanded him explicitly not to do. Right, and this, and I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole of, of predestination versus foreknowledge and all of those things, but <clears throat> Samson, in the end, he's able to judge Israel for 20 years which is a pretty long time, but it's not as long as the king's. And he had giftings that should have made his reign powerful. It should have been at the end of the story of Samson that the Philistines were a broken people that would no longer cause problems for Israel. But if you read the Old Testament, that's not what happens. He, doesn't, he kills a bunch of Philistines, but he does not break them. He does not break their power. Unlike other judges who were less gifted than Samson who had less things going for them by far than Samson, they ruined kings. They toppled kingdoms. He did not. He had a, a, a leadership role as a judge that lasted for 20 years. It could have lasted much longer. He did some things. He could have done much more. So the question for us is, is that was, was this exactly what God had planned or did Samson have a role in this? 
And this is, this is a bigger struggle uh, philosophically than, uh, than we probably get on most Sundays, but I think it's an important one to understand so that we can understand this. And that is that if God was in control absolutely of 100% of everything that Samson did, then can Samson be held liable or accountable, responsible for the ways that his life fell apart? Do we, do we blame God for the evil that Samson would go on to do? No, God's, God's blameless. God didn't, didn't cause these evils. So then what is the role? What's the connection? And so uh, I, I've thought about this for years and years and years, and I think maybe uh, this week I came across the, the best way that I can sort of express my understanding of this role between fate and human choice or destiny and choice, predeterminism, that sort of thing. But, and, it, and it's this. I like, I like to play games with my kids especially, but really anybody, you know, I'm, I, I'm not real, real picky, um, but I, I really like to play games, and some of the games that I play with my kids are games, that, there's one in particular that we play called Spot It. They love the game. You take these two cards, and you try to find things that match from card to card, right, and the, the little pictures are, they're about that big. I lose that game consistently. I used to be a lot better at it and I'm getting worse at it because apparently as you get older your eyes get worse and so like the next time that I play them I'm probably going to pull out a, like a magnifying glass and be like all right let's go uh, because they're they're whipping me at that and there are a lot of games that we're, we can be really competitive on there's my favorite game though probably my favorite game to play with them especially is a game called Risk and I have been playing Risk for 35 years. I have played hundreds, if not thousands, of games of Risk, right? I had, in high school, I played a lot, right? I have played so many games of Risk. My kids cannot beat me. I'll throw that gauntlet down right here, right now, right? They cannot beat me. Even times that we've played and all of them have decided we are all going to beat dad, they cannot beat me. And the reason is, is that I have played so much more than them that I know how the game works. I know how all the rules work. I know, I know the game inside and out. And I know them. And I know that they will start off the game saying, we're going to work together to beat dad. But I know that there's, uh, there's one or two of them that I can say, hey, listen, you don't want to beat me. Let's you and me work together to beat them. And they'll go along with it. And then I know that there's two of them that are going to, they'll be okay. They'll, they'll really work hard together. But at a certain point, the idea of being able to win themselves, not just to beat me, but to be able to win it all, Oh, it's too much. It's too great a temptation for them. And their alliance will break down. They'll fight each other. And I will win. And here's the thing, though. Even if I don't win, even if I don't win, that risk board is mine. That dining room table is mine. The house that we're playing in is mine. And it could be that if they start to beat me, I could just flip that table over. I could just flip that board over and say, Get, go to bed. I've never done that, never done that, never will do that. But understand, this plane that we are living on, this, this celestial ball of earth, this human life, it is God's. And if at any point he wanted to flip the board, he could flip the board. Right? The power is in his hands to flip the board at any point he wanted to. That is, that is his sovereign choice as God, that he as the sovereign God of this place he could destroy it all in a heartbeat if he wanted to. And so it is by his grace, his grace that we are not destroyed, that we are not consumed, that we still get to live this life. And at the same time, he, is, he has put himself into and throughout this creation that we not only depend on him for life and breath and every good thing, but at the same time that he has pieces on the board. And he is working in this place. And he is working around us. And he wants to work with us. Now, does that, does that mean that you and I couldn't choose to work against God's plans? We absolutely could. 
And in a lot of ways, Samson tries to work against God's plans. He knows what God wants for him to do in a lot of instances, and he does just the opposite. Does that foil God's plans? No, it doesn't. Does that mean that God had to flip the, the board? No, he didn't. Because he's, he's in control of enough. He's in control of this world. And so ultimately the victory will be his. Things will work out the way God wants them to. Does that mean that he takes away our ability to make choices? No. We still have the ability to make certain choices. But ultimately the ends of this world will end the way that God intends for it to. And so... In, verses, in chapters 14 and 15, we see that Samson makes a lot of big mistakes. He makes a lot of big mistakes. He does a lot of things in these chapters that there are no coloring pages for, or at least there should not be. All right? he, one of the things he does is he takes a group of foxes. He catches 300 foxes, ties their tails together, and lights torches to their tails so that he destroys the fields of grain in the Philistines. And then the Philistines burn his former fiance and father-in-law to death. It gets dark. It gets dark. Samson does some absolutely horrible and despicable things. And yet... Throughout all of it, God is working. God is working. God is doing good for his people, even accounting for the evil that Samson is doing at the same time. And so what does that mean for us? What does it mean if that's how God is working around Samson? What is God doing around your sin? What's he doing around your sin? Has your sin been so great, so grievous that it has broken God's plans? Have you ruined God's design with your sin? No, you haven't. Does that mean that you should just continue in sin? No, it doesn't. You absolutely should follow God's design for your life, but should you beat yourself up every morning, every day that you've ruined your life? No, you haven't. That you've ruined God's plan? You haven't. That you've ruined his church, his kingdom in Orange, Texas? You haven't. God is still at work. God is still in control. It is still his game board. You are still playing in this. So what does that mean about not just your sin, but your failures? What does it mean about your failures? Can God work around them? Yes. Can God work through them? Absolutely. He can and he will. And when we, when we do this, when we see, when we understand that God is working around our failures, that God is working around and through even our sinful activity, it helps us to trust that God can do great things in bad situations. God can do great things in bad situations. And I know I need to see that. I know for me as, as just a, a person, not just necessarily as a pastor, but just as a, a person waking up in the morning and reading the news, I need to know that God can do great things out of bad situations. And I don't know if it's you know, the way our media works, if there's an over-reporting of bad things, but man, there's a lot of them, aren't there? There's a lot of bad situations, a lot of bad things going on in our world, and so I need to know that God can do great things in the midst of those situations. And and learning about Samson helps me understand that, that God can do those things on a a global scale, but he can also do those on a personal scale. I think the second thing that we see in Samson's story is that sometimes we have to get out of God's way. Sometimes we have to get out of God's way, but that we, even when we are persisting, even we are continuing to do the wrong thing, misstep after misstep, God is still working. In chapter 16, it tells the story of Samson's relationship with Delilah. Samson's relationship with Delilah, and she was a Philistine woman. He was not supposed to to be with her, and yet he was. I'm going to start reading in verse 4. It says, after this, and this being after he associated with a prostitute. In verse 4, it says, after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. 
And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. What a strange question. Right? Can you imagine being in the room when that gets asked? Oh, Samson, dear, you won't believe I saw Sylvia at the market today. Oh, and another thing. If I wanted to bind you so that you'd be powerless, how could I do that? What, how does that even come up? Right? And can you imagine, like, sometimes Delilah is called a spy, which is really an insult to spies, Right? Imagine, like, can you imagine in the height of the Cold War, a Russian, you know, going up to a general and saying, like, oh, good day. Uh, just out of curiosity, where do you keep the missiles? Right? They'd be like, you know, it, that doesn't happen. That's not how it works. But she apparently just gives him a very clear, like, I am asking how to take away your power. And I think the only way, <clears throat> I think the way that this makes sense is understanding that there was a relationship here, at least on, on Samson's side. Like there was a genuine relationship, a genuine love and affection that he had for Delilah. Because in, when you're in a relationship, you want to be, you want to be known fully and loved completely. You want the person that you're in a relationship with, that you want your spouse you want them to know you and to not have to, you know, keep secrets from them. You want them to be completely known and completely loved at the same time. You want to be able to, you know, like ladies, can you imagine, you know, having to put on, like, take off your makeup after your husband goes to sleep, right? That's, it, I don't, no, probably not. You probably don't do that, right? I guess. And no lady's like, all right, I'm just going to, you go to sleep. I'm going to take off my makeup and I'm going to get up 30 minutes before you. So that I can look this. No, you want to be able to say, look, yeah, there's a mole here. There's some age spots. You know, men, can you be like, you know, hey, lady, listen, honey, I'm going to sleep in another room because I might snore a little. <laughs> uh, right? No, you just say, listen, I snore. You're just going to spend the next like 50 years elbowing me. Tough break. You know, that's, that's how life works. So you, you want to be in a relationship with someone that they just accept you. They accept the bad things about you and love you anyway. You want to be able to share with them your weakness. And so she's asking him, what, where's your, what are your warts? Where are your moles? What, what is you so picture perfect? Where is your weakness, Samson? And so he makes something up. He says, oh, if you bind me with this, these new bow strings, I'll be as weak as a baby. And so she does, and then the Philistines attack, and he breaks the bowstrings and fights them off, puts them to shame. And she says, oh, Samson, I thought you trusted me. I thought you trusted me. We're in a relationship here, and, and you told me your weakness, and I thought you were, and, and, and you're not. He says, well, I'll tell you what, if you, uh, if you were to bind me with new ropes, and she does, and it doesn't work, and it... And he goes back and forth, and if you were to braid my hair a certain way, and she, and eventually she's just like, you know what? If you're not going to tell me, if you're just, you know, not going to tell me this was your weakness, then you know, I think we're done, Samson. And finally, he says, okay, here's the key to my strength. If you were to cut my hair, if you were to cut my hair, then I would lose my strength. And she does. And he loses his strength. And verse 20 is, it says this. Chapter 16, verse 20. When it describes this moment, she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. It wasn't just that his hair was cut. It was that the Lord had left him. When you read the earlier stories about Samson's life, it talks about the Spirit of God almost like rushing into him, that he is just immediately filled with this power, this supernatural might that comes from the Lord. 
And here he reaches out sort of for that old familiar power and it's gone. It's gone. Have you ever had the, the chance to clean with like toddlers? Maybe some of, hopefully you can remember what it's like. Maybe your mother-in-law is coming to visit or grandmother-in-law and you see her house and it's always perfect and you look at your house and you're like, I gotta do something here. I remember trying to, us, Haley and I, when our kids were really little, trying to clean house before family would visit. And I don't know where the idea came from, but she at one point found um, this idea that was phenomenal, where she would take a giant box. And, and when we had one kid and then two boxes, three boxes, and she would just tie or tape these giant boxes together, throw in crayons, and then put the kids in the boxes was beautiful it was so good right because we I'd come home or we'd you know get to sort of the end of a day of cleaning and like the house could finally be clean and the inside of the boxes would be you know covered in drawings or whatever and it and, but it's like we were able to contain the mess to right here when I read Samson's story I think God man if only God could have put Samson in a refrigerator box and just been like, here, just stay in this box. I will get everything in your life clean. I will fix everything else. Just stay in this box, Samson. Samson won't. He keeps kicking his way out. He keeps going and messing up everything that God is doing until eventually God throws up his hands and says, I can't work with you. I just can't work with you, Samson. And so then Samson really gets put in the box. The Spirit of the Lord leaves Samson. He's put into chains. He's put onto a, a mill where he pushes a mill around like some sort of animal. And during this time, something finally, finally changes for Samson. It finally changes for him in that he starts to, for the, really the first time, begin to put his focus on God. He begins to put his focus on God. Now, I don't, I don't know if this is just the way that it happened or if, if this was deliberate, but when they finally, when the Philistines take out Samson's eyes, it's almost as if, it's almost as if he can't see the world literally through his eyes, but also metaphorically through his eyes. It's almost like for the first time in his life, he stops being so enamored with the things that he sees in the world. And he actually puts his focus where it should have been the whole time. He begins to focus on the Lord. And at the end of his life, he's brought into this place where the lords of the Philistines are all gathering together. And Samson sees an opportunity. He knows there's an opportunity to get some vengeance and in chapter 16, verse 28, he says this, Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Even then, even in the most spiritual thing that he does, he still has this sense of selfishness where he is thinking about his eyes. But God grants him his prayer. God answers and he is able to destroy many of the Philistines and himself at the same time. The thing about pain, the thing about pain and, and loss and those dark times is that they are supposed to bring us focus. They're supposed to bring us focus. It's supposed to be that during a time of, of pain, we are able to take some reflection and say, what is really important? We can evaluate our, our lives and say, what is, what is truly important? And it was only during this time for Samson that he's able to do that, that he is able to focus. What if we always prayed with that sort of focus? What if we always prayed with that sort of focus? 
each of us have in our lives been through different situations, trials, where we were waiting. Where we're waiting for a test result. We're waiting for a doctor's appointment. We're waiting for a surgery. We're waiting on something to happen. And during that interim, in those weeks, days, months, between the question and the answer, our ability to focus in prayer, I think, is magnified. What if we always focused like that? What if our prayer life was always that dedicated? I think that if we, well, I, I hope that if we understand the nature of gratitude, if we understand this world of ours and we see it through a lens of gratitude, and we understand that our focus should not be on the things that we see. Because the things that we see are very shallow. The things that we see are very shallow. You and I might look at a social media page of Samson or of someone else, and we see just a snapshot of how good someone else's life is. And that's, that's fine. You and I, we, we do that. that. That's great. That's great. You know, we, we share pictures of our kids and grandkids, and, and life looks good through the lens of, of social media. It's fine. I'm not saying, you know, you need to go home and take pictures of the, you know, that horrible whatever in your life and be like, look, that, that, no, that's not it. We can certainly present those things, but we shouldn't believe anyone's social media completely, especially our own. <coughs> especially our own. Like, we should never be so deceived into thinking that, that our lives are a certain way, that we are a certain uh, way. Right? We should not believe the resume versions of ourselves, but we should see ourselves honestly. We should see our lives honestly. We should recognize recognize sometimes that we are in a dark season. Sometimes it's of our own making. Sometimes it's just what God is, is allowing to happen to us. But if we can recognize that we are in that dark season and be grateful to God that he is at work in that dark season, amazing things can happen for us. We can have amazing focus on the Lord. We can focus on the Lord. We can have fervent prayer. We can have a spiritual connection that is deep and meaningful. If we, can, if we can understand that we're in a dark season and have gratitude, then we can trust that God is doing great things in spite of that bad situation. Then, then part of that fervent prayer life is to wake up every day and say, God, I don't know how <coughs> you are going to do great things with this mess. But Lord, I'm, I'm giving it to you. I'm going to give you this mess. And I'm, I'm going to do my best to stay out of your way. Do my best to stay out of your way and to watch you work. And, and when your work is finished, I will praise you. I will praise you. I will give you all the glory and honor that I possibly can for what you do with my mess. Friends, we, we have to be able to recognize that sometimes our lives are, are in a mess. Present a highlight reel on Facebook, that's, that's fine. But internally, we need to recognize the bad times. Because here's what happens when we don't. And I think this is really where Samson, where Samson falls victim to his own devices because I don't think Samson ever realized how bad things were versus how good God could have made things for him. <clears throat> for his whole life, for his whole career as a judge of Israel, whenever he reached out for the Lord's power, it was there for him. And he didn't realize how blessed he was. He didn't realize what he was doing. And, and when you live in that sort of ignorance... When you live in that sort of ignorance, then, then you don't focus on the Lord. Samson looks at himself. He looks at his life and he looks at the bad situations he's been in and how he's gotten out of them. And he has always said that it was in his own strength. 
right? That it was that he tears out the gate posts from this city and throws them up onto a mountain, and he did that. And that that lion that he's fighting with, he he killed that. And those men he killed with the jawbones, he did that. For Samson, his focus was never on the Lord except for two times when he was thirsty and when he was blind. Other than that, for Samson, it was always about him. He never put his focus on the Lord. Consequently, he never got out of God's way. He never stopped. We, we never see a moment of prayer in Samson's life where he says, Lord, show me what you want me to do. There's never a prayer where, like with, with Gideon where he even tests the Lord to say, Lord, if you want me to do this, give me a sign. Nothing. It is simply that he follows the desires of his eyes and he ruins his life. And ultimately, Samson took a lot of credit for God's work right until the end. Friends, that's not the life that we want. It's not the life that we want. We want to have a life that is, that is full of blessings, that is full of richness, that is good. But at the same time, we recognize that bad things happen. Dark seasons come. And when they're upon us, Help, let us feel gratitude. Let us feel gratitude that we go through those dark seasons not alone, but with a God that is steadfast and true. With a, a God that is always there, that we can turn our focus to him. And we can say, Lord, here's my mess. Show me what you can do. Take this over. My hope and prayer for you this week is that, that you have an amazing week of giving thanks but that it's not just food that you're thankful for. That it's not just family and friends. But I pray that you can be thankful for your failures. I pray that you can be thankful for the hard times that you've fallen on. I pray that you can be thankful for every moment of this life that God has given you because all of it is being used. All of it is being used by God to create something because whether it's in the times that are good or times that are bad, God is working to do great things. Let's put our focus on him and make sure that we don't get in his way. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for bad days. Lord, we thank you for times when the winds of change blow and, and we are not ready because it gives us an opportunity to stand back and, and see that you were ready, see that you are in control. Lord, sometimes we feel like, like kids in the midst of a storm, in the midst of, of trials, Lord, help us in those times to see you as a loving father that we can draw close to, that you can wrap an arm around us and let us know that you are in control. That we may have made some bad decisions, that we may have gone directions in our lives with sin that, that weren't what you wanted for us, but that you're still with us. And in those times when we're being tossed around, help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to see that you're doing great things. And as much as it's possible, Lord, help us to line up behind you, to be a part of doing great things with you. Lord, I pray if there's any here today that doesn't know you as a loving Heavenly Father, that doesn't know that you're always there to reach out, to put our focus on you, I pray that your spirit would move in their heart today. That today could be the day that they say, I have a heavenly father who loves me and who wants to know me eternally. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you will, stand with me while we have a time of invitation. And at this time of invitation, if there's a decision you need to make, I'll be down here. We can begin a conversation. And maybe it's not a decision that needs to be made. Maybe it's a, 
you just need to talk to somebody about what you're going through. Maybe, the, maybe you're in a dark season. And if you are, maybe you need somebody to walk through it with you.